just a small part of what's in that documentary and there's reasons why I'm going over the topics that I'm covering. And in time, um, I believe a lot of it will make sense. I've had a lot of conversations with brothers and sisters privately to where they're glad that I'm repeating the same thing over and over again because it's just now starting to click. And some of these people have been reading the scriptures for years. Um, some, some even which have been following uh, my page since I started. So again, I understand why people are waking up when they wake up. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize this. Although we see brothers and sisters sharing truth, and although they might not be fully in the truth yet, always remember that all of us came from these lies. We were all woken up from these lives, uh, lies, and we're all at different places of being woken up. And when you wake up to this knowledge, it takes a while to start understanding prophecy. It takes a while to start seeing what is truly written there, because you need the Spirit to be able to do that. And it you can't just dump all of that knowledge on someone at one time. It would be doing them a disservice. Um, so keep in mind, although you watch other lives and other people, and although you might disagree with some of the stuff that they say, I too used to believe in a trinity. I too used to believe in once saved, always saved. All of this stuff that Yahweh woke me up to, it's difficult watching people teaching stuff that's not true. But if they're leading people to Torah and they're leading people to the Father, remember, we might plant the seed and somebody else might come and water it, but we're not waking them up. It's the Father's Word that's waking them up. So when they fully awake, if that's what the Father chooses, it's the same thing with Pharaoh and um, Nebuchadnezzar. Yahweh brought these kings up to show the people his glory. And at the time, with Pharaoh... The Israelites thought that they were done, right? But yet Yahweh sent a savior for them. So we have to keep this in mind with others as well. And again, uh, I want to stress this again as well. The people that are trying to wake up family. If Yahweh has not called someone, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to wake them up. Um, I'm not saying that you should quit or, or leave your family behind unless it comes to the point where you have no other choice. However, um, Scripture is very clear that many are called, but few in the very end are going to be chosen. So it's up to each individual to seek these things out, and whether or not they believe it or whether or not they want to stay in their indoctrination. And if they're staying in their indoctrination, it's because the Father is causing them to stay in it. So there's a reason for it. So. I've learned that over the years. I used to try to, uh, I would work with certain individuals and they would get so close to understanding truth and then they turn away from it. So some people just cannot let go of their indoctrination. Some people cannot let go of what they think they know. And again, there will be an opportunity for them, for those people when certain things start to come to pass. But as I've said many times before, once the doors of the ark are shut, that's it. There is no more um, pleading with them or asking them to hear you out. They'll have their chance. So plant the seed, allow maybe other people to come and water it. And if it doesn't grow, it's not meant to grow. And we have to be able to let go of those things and those people at some point. Um, and again, don't take what I'm saying the wrong way. I'm not saying to give up on people. I'm just saying don't allow yourself to get rung up and you know, upset with people when you're watching their videos, just understand that they're not either A, called, or B, they're not fully awake yet. And that's why we keep going over this same stuff. But this is going to be a little bit different today. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to start in verse 2. It says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Allah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. So there's deep spiritual meaning to this battle, okay? 
You've got the valley that's in between, you've got good and you've got evil, okay? And in this valley is where Goliath is about to die, okay? So there's a, a deeper understanding of where I'm, I'm trying to take this. Verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cupids and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail that weight, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had graves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like the weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Now, I'm going to go into this um, weight of the, of, of, uh, of the armor, and I want you guys to really think about this for a second, because this is super important. I'm going to read this. It says, Goliath was armed to the max with a coat of mail, and he wore, which was 5,000 shekels of brass. So 5,000 shekels of brass is the equivalent of 125 pounds. Okay, This is just the shekel of brass. In addition, his helmet and his breastplate weighed 125 pounds. So now we have 255, uh, 250 pounds of uh, metals that are on this man, right? He had uh, greaves, which are shin guards of brass, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Um, and this spear, the head of the spear, weighed 17 pounds. Um, let's see. So this sh 600 shekels of iron, which is equivalent to 16 pounds. So with all of the weight of everything that he's wearing, all of his weaponry, his helmet, his breastplate, uh, bless breastplate, his great greaves, his target of brass, his spear and shield were around the weight of 700 pounds. So Take that into consideration as we're reading through this, because again, people say, well, giants didn't exist. That's not what the scripture says. Imagine trying to pick up 700 pounds. This was just his armor. And this man was a warrior at from his youth, right? This was not a, a regular sized man. So when people say, well, giants just means that they were tyrants. Yeah, they were tyrants, but they were also huge in stature. They were immensely uh, strong. They had strength, strength of the fallen, right? They had uh, bodies that were not made by the Most High. All right, um, verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel <clears throat> and said unto them, Why are you come out to, and set in your battle array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and unalive me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and unalive him, then you shall be servants and serve us all. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. So, Think about this Philistine as Satan, okay? Because that's exactly what we're reading here, right? Although it was a giant from Gath, this is Satan, and he's defying Yahweh's armies, okay? Verse 11, When Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of of that Ephrathite of uh, Beth, uh, Beth of Mel Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went amongst the men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his, of his three sons that went to battle were Eli Eliab, the first, the firstborn, the next unto him, 
Abinadab, and the third, Shema. And David was the youngest of the three eldest, followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David is keeping his father's sheep. Okay, so this is a type and shadow of our Messiah. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself for 40 days. Okay, so 40 days is a significant number in Scripture um, all throughout the book, right? So do your research on the 40 days and what this is talking about. Verse 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephod of preached corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of his of, of your brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Allah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went uh, sorry, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army, uh, battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper. So David's not just leaving his sheep unattended. He's leaving them with someone who can keep them and keep them protected. Um, and David left the carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistine and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. So we just read that all of these men who were soldiers, when they heard of this Goliath, they were terrified. Now there's already men battling back and forth, but Goliath hasn't come out yet, right? And he's made it, he's made it known, bring out your man and fight against me. And if they beat me, then this is how they were going to solve this problem, this war that was going back and forth. It was going to be one man against another man. And whoever prevailed was going to be the one who would, whoever lost would be the servants to the one who prevailed. Um, verse 24, or sorry, verse 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is uh, that is come up? Surely to defy Israel he is come up. And it shall be the man who unaliveth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that unaliveth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living Elohim? So you've got the youngest of all of the sons, David, a keeper of sheep, who is now running into this battle, and he's asking who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of my Elohim, right? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that unaliveth him. And, uh, where was I, 28. And Eli Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? So Eliab, his brother, is irritated that David is here, and he thinks that David is prideful and arrogant. 
right? And in, in actuality, it's Eliab's fear, right? Eliab is afraid to be the one to go down there and fight. And then he goes on to tell David, he says, I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. For you are come down that you mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? So this question is now being asked. Now, this goes for all of us, right? We know that things are coming that are going to be rough. And there's people that will hop on a live when we're teaching and say, well, you're just spreading fear and you're pushing this and you're pushing that. No, we know that there's a serious problem that's about to happen. And we're trying to warn people what not to do and what they should do according to this book. But here we have David asking his brother, like, why are you saying this to me? Why are you telling me that I'm prideful? Eliab was jealous of David, right? And Eliab always thought that David was lying about all of his stories and things that he had done while protecting these sheep, right? And the sheep if you think about the sheep as being the children of Israel, think about David as being the Messiah, think about Goliath as being Satan, then this story starts to make more sense, right? Verse 30, it says, And he turned from him toward one another and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. So David turns from Eliab and says to them, Is, is there no cause for us to be here? Will none of you go out and fight? And when he says this to them, they say the same thing, right? They're telling him, you only came down here to see the fight. Why have you left your sheep? Go back, shepherd boy, do what you need to do. Stop bothering us. We have a war to deal with here. Verse 30, uh, verse 31, sorry. And when the words were heard, which David spake, uh, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. So Saul heard the words that David said because the, uh, Saul's soldiers are now back there somewhat mocking David, right? Like here's this young shepherd boy and he's out there running his mouth saying, is there not a cause? So Saul sends for David. Verse 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So again, I'm not, don't take this story and let's not say, well, Saul is God, because we know that's not the case. But the foreshadowing of this, just like we were talking about with Pharaoh and Joseph, obviously Pharaoh wasn't uh, God, but it, it was a, it's a type and shadow. Pharaoh gives Joseph his ring and his power and his authority, and only in the throne room was Joseph um, or Pharaoh, more powerful than Joseph. But outside of that throne room, all of Egypt had to, had to bend the knee to Joseph because he was second in command. So it's the same type and shadow here. So David is saying to Saul, let no, man, uh, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man from uh, a man of war from his youth. So Saul's in doubt here, right? Saul is saying, you're still not even of the age to go into battle. You're still a youth. And this man that you're talking about going and fighting, he's been a soldier since his youth. He's been unaliving people since he was a child. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. Okay, so again, think about our Messiah. Your servant has kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and I smote him and I delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and I smote him and slew him. Verse 36, thy servant, Yeshua, slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living Elohim. This is pure boldness, people. Verse 37, David said, Moreover, Yahweh that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will 
deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and Yahweh be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded up his sword upon his armor, and he assessed to go, for he had not proved it. So David wasn't able to wear Saul's armor. And again, people have said it's because he was too small. I don't believe that. I believe that he didn't, tr he didn't want to trust in uh, armor and a sword and a shield. David was an expert with a sling and stones, right? And he's clearly, as a, as a youth, has already fought a lion and a bear protecting the sheep, okay? And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Proved them, in, or, in the sense of, I don't trust these uh, weapons that you're giving me. And this is Saul, remember, the leader, the king here saying, take my armor, right? And David saying, no, I haven't proved your armor. Uh, and David put them off. Verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand, so he's got his shep shepherd's staff, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. So this is just a, a bag that they would wear on their waist uh, made out of animal skin. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came, in, came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. So Dave, uh, Goliath has a man holding his shield, right? And a man that brings out his uh, spear as well. But imagine the weight of this. So Goliath is a king to these people because of his size. Verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair continence. Now, I want you to look up this word ruddy, and I want you to look up this word fair, okay? Because this is describing what Israel looks like. Verse 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Big mistake. Verse 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh. Remember the Messiah. They tore his flesh off of him, right? And when he arose, his flesh was intact. Okay? And he's Goliath is now saying to David, Come to me and I will... Give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with sword and with spear and with shield, but I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. Pretty bold. This day will Yahweh deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is uh, an Elohim or there, there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that Yahweh saved not with sword and spear. For the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. So David's not like, Standing back saying, oh, wow, man, this is a big guy. I hope I, I hope I can prevail here. It's, he's not just going out there with no idea of what he's doing. He fully believes, as we just read, without a doubt, as he was speaking to Saul, as the father delivered him from the bear and the lion, 
so will the Father deliver him from this massive giant standing before him. Verse 49, And David put his hand in the bag and took thence a stone, and he slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Now, we just read about the weight of, of uh, uh, Goliath's armor, his sword, his spear, and all of that combined was around 700 pounds, right? So David now has smote the Philistine with a stone, but he doesn't have a sword. And what did he just tell the giant a little while ago? He told Goliath, not only was he going to unalive him, but that he was going to take his head, right? Verse 51, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine. So he climbs up on him and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was unalived, they fled. So, again, I've, I've shared this before, but here you have a keeper of sheep, keeping his father's sheep, protecting the sheep from attack, from evil people, right? Animals in this case, a bear, lion, but he was a keeper of sheep. And he goes out and fights and, sm and smotes this giant, and as he's out there, he's without fear whatsoever. He denies taking the armor of Saul, probably because he couldn't fit in it, not because he was too small, probably because he was too big. And he knew how to sling a stone hard enough to unalive a giant in full armor. 700 pounds of armor and one little stone from a brook that he went and picks up. He goes down to this brook and he picks up five smooth stones. Now, David didn't at one second believe that he was going to miss. That's not why he picked up five smooth stones. Okay? So keep in mind, all of these types and shadows of our Messiah, right? We see David going to Saul and Saul is the, the leader, right? And he's saying, Send me and I will fight this Philistine. Well, who's going to prevail over Satan? Who's coming back to destroy and bind Satan? We know that the Father will destroy him in the end. But who's coming back to destroy Satan's works? Satan's children, right? All right, so now let's jump to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. Um, and I'm going to start in verse 18. Now this is some time after, okay? Now we're going to understand why David picked up five smooth stones instead of just one, okay? It says in verse 18, and it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Shepekiah Sh the Hushathite slew Sap, which was the son of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where uh, El Elinon, the son of Jeharagim, the Bethamite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. So Goliath had a brother, right? The staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So not only did Goliath have this one brother, right? Because it's being explained in verse 19. Verse 20, And there was yet a battle in Gath, where there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. So now we have this giant's son, okay? And when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So how many total was that? 
five, right? Four, we're just slew here in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. But we read in 1 Samuel 17 that David picked up five smooth stones. David knew good and well that there was a total of five of these giants that were related to Goliath. One being his brother and the others being born of Goliath. So Goliath had sons and a brother. Two brothers and then the other three sons. So this is why David picks up these five smooth stones when he originally goes out to fight Goliath. Talk about faith and, and um, having no doubt in what you're able to do when Yahweh stands behind you. So this isn't all about fear, folks. This is about preparing people for what's coming. Now, I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 32. I want you guys to listen very closely to this. For all that deny the serpent seed doctrine, for all that deny the giants, this is one of many, many places in Scripture. But this is a lamentation that's being taken up. And there's a lot of depth to this. Starting in verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the 25th year, in the 12th month, in the first day of the month, that the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, Take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Satan, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the sea, and thou hast camest forth with thy rivers, and thou troublest the waters with thy feet, and thou foulest the rivers. So again, this verse 2 He's talking about Satan being like a lion, right? And we remember these lions, we know that the Messiah is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but these lions in scripture are also talking about certain ethnicities, okay? Now he's saying that Satan, or this king Pharaoh, Egypt, is like a lion who stirs, who stirs up the nations, who... Uh, who, who cometh forth with his rivers, his flood, right? In Revelation 12. And troublest the waters, the people, with thy feet. And foulest the rivers, the Torah, the doctrine, the teachings. Thus saith Yahweh, I will therefore spread out my net over thee with a company of many people. And they shall bring thee up into my net. And I will leave thee upon the land, and I will cast thee forth upon an open field, and I will cause all the fowls of heaven to remain upon thee, and I will fill the breast of the whole earth with thee. Now this is in Revelation, right? This is the wedding supper of Yahweh, right? Or the wedding supper of the Lamb, however you want to put it. And I will lay your flesh upon the mountains and fill the valleys with thy height blood up to the horse's bridle okay i will also with your blood i will also with thy blood the land wherein thou swimmest even to the mountains and the rivers shall be full of thee and when i shall put thee out i will cover the heaven and i will make the stars thereof dark the sun shall be darkened the moon shall withdraw her shining and the stars shall fall from heaven. This is the parable of the fig tree. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith Yahweh. What are the bright lights in heaven? The angels, right? So he's saying, all these bright lights are going to become dark over you. Now, does that mean they're not... The stars aren't going to be shining. No, this darkness means death to Satan and his people. I will also vex the hearts of many people, the locust army. When I shall bring thy destruction amongst the nations into the countries which thou hast not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at thee and their kings shall be horribly afraid of thee when I shall 
uh, banish my sword, sorry, brandish my sword before them. Who's his sword? Yeshua, right? When he's, when he's going to pull his sword, which is in the same book, says, when I pull my sword, my glittering, when he's, even when he's talking about his glittering spear, all of these things have meaning. But he says, I will pull my sword from his sheath, right? And then, uh, sorry, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life in the day of thy fall. For thus saith Yahweh, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon thee. By the sword of the mighty will I cause thy multitude to fall, the terrible of the nations, all of them, and they shall spoil the pomp of Egypt, and all the multitude thereof shall be destroyed. I will destroy also all the beasts thereof from beside the great waters. All of these beasts are speaking about all of the fallen, the great waters, the people. Neither shall the foot of man trouble them any more, nor the hoof of beast trouble them. Then will I make their waters deep and cause their rivers to run like oil, saith Yahweh. When I shall make the land of Egypt desolate and the country shall be uh, destitute of that whereof it was full, when I shall smite all of them that dwell therein, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. This is the lamentation wherewith they shall lament for her. The daughters of the nations shall lament her. They shall lament for her, even for Egypt and for all of her multitude, saith Yahweh. It came to pass also in the 25th year, in the 15th day of the month, that the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations unto the nether parts of the earth with them that go down to the pit. Whom dost thou pay in beauty? Go down and be laid with the uncircumcised. What did David just call Goliath? An uncircumcised Philistine, right? Verse 20, They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty. This word mighty is not talking about regular men. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down and they lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. A sure is there in all of her company. His graves are about him. All of them are slain and fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her graves, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. So these, these people to Yahweh are dead. Okay? There is Alam and all of her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. Again, hell. This is talking about hell, people. Verse 25, They have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. This is talking about they will... Yahweh will cause them to be put in their beds where the worm never dies and they'll never rise from this. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Um, through their terror was caused in the land of the living. Yet they have borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. There is Meshech in Tubal, and all of her multitude, her graves are round about him. All of the uncircumcised, slain by the sword, uh, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. 
So all of these nations that we're reading about are round about Satan, who is in the pit, okay? And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen on uh, fallen of the uncircumcised, okay? So understand the separation here. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. This is bearing witness to the book of Enoch and how these men learned war, how they learned how to make weapons of war. And they are laid there with their swords and their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones. Uh, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living, yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and shall lie with them that are slain by the sword. There is Edom, the Edomites, Esau, and her kings and her princes, which with their mighty are laid by them that were slain by the sword, and they shall lie with the uncircumcised and with them that go down to the pit. There be the princes of the north. We know who the princes of the north are. And all of them, and all of the, oh, sorry, all of the Zidians, which are gone down with the slain. With their territory, they are ashamed of their might. And they lie with the uncircumcised, with them that be slain by the sword, and bear the shame with them that go down to the, to the pit. Pharaoh, Satan, shall see them, and shall be comforted over all his multitude, even Pharaoh and all of his army, slain by the sword, saith Yahweh. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword, even Pharaoh and all of his multitude, saith Yahweh Elohim. So, again, we could continue reading in Ezekiel. There's so much. Um, the next is going to start, Ezekiel 33 is going to start explaining more about uh, the children. It says again, the word of Yahweh came unto me saying, son of man, speak to the children of thy people. So this is Ezekiel talking about his own people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if, when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. This is a future prophecy. This is not a prophecy about King Pharaoh. This is a prophecy about Satan in the end times. Edom being destroyed, the book of Obadiah, right? The Messiah staining all of his raiment, blood up to the horse's bridle, all of these nations that refuse Yahweh being sent into hell, all that were created by the fallen that Yahweh did not plant, being sent to the sides of the pit. Now, Yahweh is telling Ezekiel to speak to the children of his people and tell them, when you hear someone blowing the trumpet, when you see the sword coming upon the land, it's your job. Blow the shofar. Warn the people. Turn back to the Father. If you warn the people and they don't listen to you, their blood is upon their own head, not yours. Verse 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. This is why we don't just skip over the stuff that people don't like to talk about in scripture. This is why we spend so much time emphasizing why it's important for you to understand this, right? I don't want anybody's blood on my hands. But I've also said this before. I'm not going to become a liar because someone wants to call me a racist or because someone doesn't agree with what this book says because they can't understand what it's saying. 
This is a book that has to be read with the Spirit. And yes, there are certain people that will fully understand it. And I'm not saying all the depths of Scripture. I'm just saying they will fully understand what's going to happen during the end. Many of them are already awake. But you're going to have this all these different sects, which they call us sect, a sect or, or heresy, heretics. They call us liars. But they themselves have no idea who the Father is, who his Son is. They're still worshiping the Son, just like they did the serpent on the bronze pole with Moses. Not realizing that Yahweh sent that bronze serpent, which was their Savior in that moment. But then people went back and started worshiping the pole with the, with the serpent on it. And they had to go back and destroy it. Right? This is the same thing that the Messiah said. When you see the Son of Man lifted up on a pole to become a curse. That was a foreshadowing of the Messiah. The problem is now is the church is still worshiping what became a curse on a pole for us. They're worshiping him instead of the one who sent him. And the Messiah never said, worship me. He always pointed us back to the Father. Let me reread verse 6. It says, But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Who is he a watchman for? Is he a watchman for the house of the Philistines? Is he a watchman for the house of the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites? No, he's a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them for, uh, from me. So, how do they how are how are the watchmen to warn people if they're not hearing the word from Yahweh's mouth? This isn't just stuff that are that, that we're just saying, yeah, this is what I think it says. Let me just tell the people a story and maybe they'll believe me. No, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Either you see it or you don't. Either you believe the truth or you're going to deny the truth. Either way, it's going to be preached to everyone. There will be nobody with an excuse that says, no, I didn't hear this word, especially when the two prophets arrive on the scene. They're, they're the two witnesses. So when that happens, if people are still in denial, then, well, that's just too bad. Verse 8, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So even the wicked, the people that love to hop on here and, and call names and all of that, understand when you do that, as Jason said yesterday, without hearing out the entire matter, all you're doing is heaping hot coals on your own head. You're not bothering me. I could care less what people think. I love my brothers and sisters but I could care less what the world thinks about what this book says. They don't understand it. Nonetheless, we're still called to warn them. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou does not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, and his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he does not turn away from his way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions, what is, what is transgression? Sin, right? And it's, it's violation of the Torah, breaking the commandments. And our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I liveth, saith Yahweh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. 
For the wickedness of the wicked shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, lawlessness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So you have a choice here. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, and he shall surely live. So here's the question. When the Messiah returns, if you're walking in the law, statutes, and commandments, are any of your sins going to be mentioned to you? They're forgiven. And this is what the Christian church is confusing. Well, my past, present, future sins, they're washed away. That's it. I can con continue to live lawlessly, not live by the commandments, and I'm going to make it into the kingdom. No, you're not. That's not what this is saying. Whether you believe we're in a new covenant or an old covenant is beside the point. The covenant that was given, right, to all of Israel had a law attached to it. The only thing that has changed is the priesthood. Remember, the law that was given was the law of life and liberty, which is the commandments. Yahweh said, if you keep my commandments, Deuteronomy 28 and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30, if you choose life, you'll be blessed. But if you choose death, you fall under the curses of the law. So it's making this very clear. Uh, let's see. Verse 17. Yet the children of thy people say, The way of Yahweh is not equal, but as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked man turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet you say, The way of Yahweh is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you, every one after his ways. Works, people. Either you chose to be obedient by loving the Father and doing what he has called us to do, walking in righteousness. How are you going to enter the kingdom of heaven and stand before the Father and say, no, your law is evil. Your commandments are evil. Or in the same breath say, no, I believe your laws and commandments are good, they're life and all of this, but... You sent your son, therefore I didn't keep any of them because he did it for me. That's the whole reason he sent his son. So that you could return back to him in righteousness. Not so that you could return back to him and stand before him and utter a bunch of excuses. There will be no utterance, no lie that will come out of any man's mouth before the father. So it's not the father judging the righteous here. It's said very clearly, if the righteous man dies walking in the statutes... His sins will not be mentioned. They're washed away. The Father's not going to take the Messiah's blood and say, Nope, you did this, this, and this. Either the Messiah's blood has washed you, brought you into the sanctification process, and when you die, you've died in righteousness according to what Yahweh says is righteousness. Not the Talmudic man-made laws and traditions that people are turning back to now, denying the Messiah, denying the virgin birth. You're going in back into Jewish tradition. The scribes is who you're following. When you start denying the virgin birth, you're reading the, the text of the, the lying pen. Jeremiah 8.8. 8. That's exactly what you're doing. You're taking Jewish tradition and you're going by what they've added to the text and you're falling away from your Messiah. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, verse 21. And it came to pass in the 25th year of the captivity, in the 10th month, in the 5th day of the month, that one 
that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. Now the hand of Yahweh was upon, uh, was upon me in the evening uh, afore that he was escaped and came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning and my mouth was opened and I was no more dumb. Then the word of Yahweh came unto me saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak saying, Abraham was one and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh your Elohim, You eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and, and shall ye possess the land? Yet stand upon your sword, you work abomination, eating the swine's flesh, doing all of these abominable things. And you defile every one his neighbor's wife, and shall you possess the land? Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith Yahweh your Elohim, As I liveth, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field will I give to the beasts to devour and that they be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through them. Then shall they know that I, Yahweh, when I have laid the land most desolate because of all of their abominations which they have committed, and thou, son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls, in the doors of the houses, speaking to one another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from Yahweh. And they come unto thee as people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. That's what's happening. It's exactly what's taking place. And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song, Deuteronomy 32, of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. What are they playing in the book of Revelation 144? They're harping on their harps, and they're singing a new song. Is it a new song? Because if you keep reading in Revelation, it says the song that they're singing is the song of Moses. The song of Moses is Deuteronomy 32. If you can sing that song, then you can wake up many nations, the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. That's the whole purpose of this. So again, he's saying, And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song, of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they that hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet had been among them. So when, you, when you're hearing crucifix, when you're hearing Chad, Emmanuel, Jason, all the brothers that are out there teaching truth, they're singing to you this song of Moses. I've got an entire teaching on YouTube about the song of Moses. If you deny the song of Moses, you're denying the law. You're denying what Yahweh has called the believers, his church, his remnant. You're denying what, he, what he's saying in Deuteronomy 32. The song of Moses is the song that the 144,000 are playing, but people don't want to hear it. They're rejecting it just as they did with all of the other prophets. Now this right here is saying that they are prophets. So when, when people are bashing Michael for just correcting and showing people truth, heaping hot coals on their own head. When people come against Jason and say that he's a false prophet and all this other stuff, I've, I've seen and heard it all. Once Yahweh removes these people, 
which is what's going to happen. And then they're going to be handing each other the Bible saying, read this, understand it, please. The calamity around us is too much. Our hearts are failing for fear of the things that we're seeing. Read this, I pray you. I cannot, I don't understand it. Why? Because there was a prophet in their midst at one point who was blowing the shofar as a watchman warning the people. A sword, the Messiah, is coming. There will be blood up to the horse's bridle. You will not be raptured out of here. You cannot go into the Old Testament and change what prophecy says. And if you jump into the New Testament and think you have understanding of what the New Testament is saying and you don't understand prophecy, you're deceiving yourself. The only way to understand the fulfillment, which is the New Testament, of the old prophecies in the book, I'm not going to even say Old Testament, this is one story, right? It's not, this is the old story and now we have a new story. No, it's one story from front to back. If, you, if you're doing away with, you know, three quarters of the book, and saying, oh, we only have to live by Paul's letters. The Messiah, who is the son of Yahweh, who is also a prophet, said that Paul could change the gospel. Does that make any sense? All of these stories and all of the prophets that came before the Messiah came. Right? And Jason was speaking about this a little bit yesterday. It says... Um, in the beginning of the New Testament, it says, and all of the prophets were, were until John. Question, was John a prophet? Yes. Was the Messiah a prophet? Yes. What that is saying is that the people, if you read it in context, the people that were, uh, they were forcefully pressing their self into the truth because the Messiah was coming. The Messiah was there amongst them. They knew the prophecy. They knew what John was doing because they understood the prophets. So when people say, well, the prophets were only up until John, so the Messiah wasn't a prophet, who was born first, John or the Messiah? And to say that the prophets aren't still speaking today, that's not what this says. This is clearly speaking about, in the end days, as we just read in the prior chapter, all of those that are following Satan will fall by the sword, blood up to the horse's bridle. In fact, it even mentioned the sun and the moon not giving their light, the stars not giving their light, the stars becoming dark upon those that are on the earth. All of the armies in heaven in Revelation 19 that follow the Messiah, that's what it's talking about. But yet people deny it and say, nope, those prophecies are no good. That's for those, This is for the Jews. When you say this is for the Jews, you're saying that this is for a people that are denying the Messiah and saying that the Messiah is not going to return, the Messiah is not real, he's, he's a liar, he's a false prophet. All this stuff that I'm hearing people say now, it sickens me. And you're going to regret opening your mouth saying the stuff that you're saying. Because every single prophecy in this book has come to pass. And I'm not talking about the people that get on there and just their whole life is about, they put a, a background picture up and it says, the God of the Bible is false. And all they do is go around in circular arguments and try to make sense of a book that they've never even studied and never will study because they've denied the book entirely. I'm talking about people that are trying to be teachers when maybe they should just be studying the word. Maybe they should do what Paul did and take three years and study the book and see if, it, if it's Yahweh that's called you to be a watchman. Because everybody believes that they're a watchman. Many are, but many aren't. Many wouldn't know what to tell someone. Many are claiming to be watchmen, but can't tell somebody where to go in scripture. Do we have to keep the law, Christians? Well, what does Deuteronomy 32 say? Can you read Deuteronomy 32 and break it down line for line and show me how it connects to every single part of this book? 
It's not just a page that Moses is singing a song. And it's not a new song. It's a song that we have forgotten because we've been asleep. But that song has been brought back to the forefront of our minds. And for those people that are denying it, can't help you. I'm trying to. Yes, you're supposed to keep all Ten Commandments and all of the law. Again, the Ten Commandments are the commandments. It's the reason why the sacrificial was added as a punishment, because they didn't keep the Ten Commandments. Then the sacrificial law was added as a punishment. Then people read Paul's letters and say, see, we're not supposed to be keeping the law. What law? Paul preaches about seven different laws, which are all talking about a sanctification process. If, you're, if he's speaking about no longer being under the law, he's talking about being under the curses in the divorce letter in Deuteronomy 28. If you do wickedly and you don't keep the commandments and walk in his statutes, all of those curses will fall upon you. But if you keep them and you choose life, all of those blessings will follow you wherever you go. Whatever you do, whatever you put your hand to, you'll be blessed. So, again, no. When people say, well, I thought the Messiah said it was only two. Read it, what the Messiah is saying. The Messiah didn't change the law. Those weren't new commandments, folks. They were commandments out of his Father's law. Love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the Ten Commandments. That's exactly what he was saying. And then people say, well, he said when he came, when he came and changed the law that if you committed adultery, you have sinned. But I say, if you look at a woman with lustful intention, you've sinned. That's not what it says. It says that you have committed adultery in your heart. If you look at someone with lustful intention, have you sinned? No. It's the act of committing the act of adultery. That is the sin. If we were, again, I've said this before, if we were judged by every thought that we have, Satan is constantly whispering in your ear. If we were judged by everything that Satan is whispering in your ear 24-7, through TV, through actors, through whatever, all the things of the world, Satan is right there in front of your face and most of you don't even see it. You don't realize that you're living in his world. No, Jesus came to fulfill the law. That doesn't mean he did away with it. Again, people, let me read this passage to you. It's in Matthew chapter 5, and let's see if the Messiah did away with the law. Because you guys keep saying this stuff, and you don't read the rest of what it's saying. Verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. It's not just the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, to, Christian, to Christianity or Christians, they believe this means you don't have to keep the law anymore. But let's keep reading. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, has heaven and earth passed yet? No. Not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled? Has the Messiah returned? Are we on the new earth? All has not been fulfilled yet, people. Now, verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But... Whosoever shall do them and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is verse 20 talking about? Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, what is that saying? Well, the scribes and Pharisees sat on the seat of Moses, did they not? They read the Torah. They knew the Torah. They could recite the Torah, word for word, line for line, the entire thing. But did they keep the Torah? No. The Messiah made that very clear, that they were hypocrites. He said, when the scribes and Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses, do all that they say. Because when they're seated on Moses' seat, they're reading the Torah. 
But he goes on to say, but when they're not seated, seated on the seat of Moses, do not do as they do because they are hypocrites. So again, don't, don't say that the Messiah fulfilled the law so that you don't have to keep it. He showed you what it means to fully walk it out in your flesh. He gave you an example of what it looked like in the flesh since the people couldn't get it on the tablets of stone. Remember, those people's carcasses fell in the wilderness. They didn't enter the promised land. They said, but didn't do. When Yahweh cuts a covenant with us, we have to follow through with what that covenant involves. When the Messiah shed his blood, now we have a new priesthood. Same law, new priesthood. That priesthood took away the sacrificial law. Now we can return back to being obedient to the first law that was given. The law of life and liberty, which is what Paul preaches about. <clears throat> Dig deeper, Jesus is a vegetarian and they covered it up with books of choice in the Bible. I have no idea what you're talking about. We're not talking about what Jesus ate. Um, uh, let's see. Let's, let me figure. Let me finish reading what I was reading. Um, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not unalive, and whosoever shall unalive shall be in danger of the judgment. Why? Well, it's part of the law. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Why? Because if you stay angry with your brother, eventually it might lead to you unaliving him. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring a gift to the altar, and you rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, so in other words, you have a problem with your brother, and you're ready to, to give up a prayer to the Father, don't pray yet until you've left your gift at the altar, and you go first to be reconciled to thy brother and then come and give your gift. Otherwise, the father's not going to hear your prayer because it's the Messiah who takes that prayer and offers it up to the father. He's your high priest and mediator. However, just because he spilled his blood does not mean you're in the new covenant. The new covenant begins... Very clearly, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. John looks up and sees New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. When does the Father wipe away all tears? When does the Father say, no more death, no more sorrow? It's a renewed covenant in the original text. It's not a new covenant. It's a renewed covenant. In fact, let's read it. Let's go read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 and see what it says. Again, it's, there's many, many places we could go read, but this is one that's pretty clear for the people that want to argue about, no, no, we're in a new covenant. We're in a new covenant, not understanding how a covenant works at all. All right, Jeremiah 31. Uh, sorry, where am I? Yeah, right here. It says, Behold, the days cometh, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is Ezekiel chapter 37. Okay? Ezekiel 37 is the valley of dry bones. When Israel and Judah become one house again, we won't be on this earth. That is the renewed covenant, people. <clears throat> Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them. Question, is Yahweh still a husband unto us? No, we are divorced. That's the whole purpose of Revelation 21. We are going to be remarried back to the father. We can go read about this divorce that was given to us, this bill of divorce, according to the father's law. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law, law, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
When does this happen? Let's go look. Revelation 21. So I swear, so many people that just keep arguing out of lack of understanding, I just, you guys don't want to hear truth, so you just don't listen. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The old earth is gone. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Yahweh out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the Messiah, the 144,000. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and Yahweh himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. And Yahweh shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. So when does the new covenant begin? On this earth? That's not what we just read. We just read this in Jeremiah 31. What did he say? He said uh, in verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they all shall know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Question. If the Messiah's blood has washed away all of your iniquity once and for all, just because you confessed his name, why will the Father forgive our iniquity and remember it no more after this earth has passed away? I'm going to read verse 36. In those ordinances, or sorry, if those ordinance de de ordinances depart from me, saith Yahweh, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation from before uh, from before me forever. Thus saith Yahweh, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they that ha for all they have done, saith Yahweh. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that the city shall be built to Yahweh from the tower of Hanel unto the gate of the corner. And the measuring line shall yet go forth against it upon the hill of Gareb, and shall compass about Go Goeth, and the whole valley of dead bodies, and the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the house gate towards the east, shall be holy unto Yahweh, and it shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. Context, people. Context is important. This is why the prophets are important for you to understand. Because the churches are teaching you, oh, we're in a new covenant. No, you're not. The new covenant has not begun yet. The Messiah's blood has been shed. In the book of Hebrews, it says that the old covenant is waxing and ready to perish. It doesn't perish until you've made it through this sanctification process and you are on the new earth and you've completed that period of righteousness of being made righteous so that you can be presented back to the Father when he returns in Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 20, we are on the new earth with the Messiah for a thousand years. The whole purpose of that thousand year reign is so that you can be made without spot or blemish and presented back to your Father in heaven. That's the whole purpose of the thousand year millennial reign. But you guys are skipping right over that and saying, nope, we're going to heaven. Nowhere in this book does it say you go to heaven. The book of Revelation makes it very clear that the Father is bringing heaven to earth, the new earth. So when you die, 
you're not in heaven. Your family members aren't up there having a feast and walking around in white robes and glowing. No one's going anywhere, according to the book of Revelation, until after the thousand-year millennial reign. Those that make it into the thousand-year millennial reign will live for up to a thousand years, which is the beginning of the book. The generation, one generation in Adam's day was a thousand years. So it's going to go back to that. But can you die during that thousand years? Yes, you can. And many will. Will, will both good and evil be on the earth during that time? Yes, there will. That's why Satan is let out. The battle of Gog and Magog takes place where Satan gathers up all the nations of the earth to fight against the holy city. And then Yahweh rains fire down and destroys Satan once and for all after he's let loose. The people are already saying, no, 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 no. We're in that little season right now. Makes no sense. You're not on the new earth. The Messiah is not seated on the throne. There are not 144,000 under the Messiah or that are equal with the Messiah that are ruling over all the land that was promised to the remnant of Jacob. But again, the Christian church says, no, 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 it's only us. We're going to get raptured out of here. There, not, nowhere in this book does it say you're going to get raptured out of here. And then people say, well, yeah, it doesn't say rapture. It doesn't mention a rapture, period. The thing that it says is at the seventh trump, you will be caught up in the air to meet the Messiah upon his return with the 144,000 and all the armies of heaven and changed in the twinkling of an eye. In Matthew 24, the Messiah makes it very clear that after the tribulation of those days, that every eye shall see the Son of Man returning on the clouds. Not before, after. But somehow these people get into Paul's letters and say, no, 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 the Christian church gets raptured out of here first. Show me where it says that. In fact, Paul made it very clear that there would come a great falling away first and that son of perdition, Satan, would be revealed. When does that happen according to the prophets? When is Satan revealed in the period of tribulation? When is Satan going to be revealed? If you guys knew scripture, Christians, again, I'm not trying to be mean. If you knew scripture, you wouldn't go with all these false doctrines. You would listen. When you hear a watchman trying to help you and teach you and show you that you're leaning on other men's understanding instead of what this book says, you might learn something, but most of you are too busy talking, trying to defend your position, which is a lie. The reason you don't know this and you can't read it is because you're worshiping the Son of God as God. Breaking the first commandment, denying the fourth commandment, when you say the Sabbath is every day. The Sabbath is a day of rest. So you just get to pick and choose. When the Father says what day the Sabbath day is, now you say the Sabbath is every day because the Messiah said that he is the master of the Sabbath because he had the key of David. Again, if you don't know what the key of David is, don't say foolish stuff like that. Don't say the Messiah changed. As a matter of fact, let me, let me make something very clear to you guys in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 4, let's see if the Messiah changed the Sabbath or not. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying, In David, today, after such a long time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, the Messiah, harden not your hearts. For if Yeshua had given them rest, then would he not have afterwards spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of Yahweh. Well, it seems here in Hebrews that the Messiah didn't give us another day. Otherwise, he would have afterwards mentioned it. What does it mean, free willy, to rest in the Messiah? Does that mean you change the Sabbath day that the Father made very clear was an everlasting perpetual covenant that will never change, even during the thousand-year millennial reign and after? Do the prophets say that when we enter the new earth that we're not going to keep the law? That we're not going to be keeping the Sabbath? That we're not going to be keeping the feast days? No, they say the complete opposite. 
So if you don't think you have to keep the law now, and then when you get into the new earth, all of a sudden you're going to understand how to keep it, how are you supposed to keep it? You're not going to enter the new earth because you haven't been being obedient to the Father's will. Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Uh, I don't know what that means. Mythos is my Sabbath and you must keep it holy. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> yeah, the Sabbath is definitely a sign between us and the Father so that the world knows that we are his people. No, Sunday is not biblical. Guys, go back and study what the Roman Catholic Church did. Okay, The Roman Catholic Church openly came out and said that they changed the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. A pope decided that. A man, wicked man at that. So if you guys think that it's acceptable for a man to go in and say, nope, we're no longer keeping the Sabbath day on the day that it's supposed to be kept, we're going to change it to Sunday. Who has authority over the word of Yahweh? Can any man change this? <laughs> Jessica Roberts, that's fine. Um, I'm not, I'm not here trying to uh, attack people for uh, not keeping the Sabbath. You can love the Messiah, and he is worthy of worship, but he's not the Father, right? We don't worship him like we worship the Father. Uh, many years, many years. Pre Willy, I'm not understanding what you're what you're trying to say in your messages. I know you don't have a lot of room to text, but I'm not understanding what it is you're trying to. But what point? What point are you trying to make? Can you or can you not? Can you go back and change your prophecy? When the Father says this is the day that you must keep for all eternity, can you go back and change that day? It's that simple. Uh, are we supposed to be set apart? Yes, that's what the Sabbath day is. Friday sundown, Saturday sundown is the Sabbath. Uh, I read multiple mul multiple different versions of the Bible. I just read out of the KJV because that's what people read the most out of, but I have multiple different scriptures that I study from. <clears throat> uh, that's awesome. <clears throat> no problem. What was the Sabbath changed to Sunday? Well, the Roman Catholic Church changed to Sunday because they don't want you to keep it properly. Uh, I have read Isaiah. I've read Isaiah many times. Isaiah 2 doesn't make any mention of changing the Sabbath day. Sorry. I just read it to you out of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I don't read the Jewish Bible. Sorry, guys. When You guys have to understand... Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9 make it very clear that there are people that are claiming to be Jews and are not, but do lie. So those people over in that land that everybody says is the holy land, the promised land, what was the name of the promised land that was promised to Jacob, who became Israel? Was it not the land of Canaan? <laughs> yes. Yahweh says that he hates their new moons and their new feast, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, all pagan traditions that all of these pagans have made up and incorporated into the Christian belief, and they're keeping those things instead of his Sabbaths, his feast days. Explain to me how we got into serving uh, Nimrod. If you guys even studied Easter, have you even looked into Easter and Christmas? Easter is Ishtar, people, the, the fertility goddess. And on the day that you guys celebrate Easter is the day that they would go out and have these gatherings and all the women would get pregnant by different men. And nine months later, on December 25th, they would offer those children up to Moloch. So you have your holy trinity, Nimrod, Tammuz, and um, Ishtar, the queen of heaven.
Free Willy, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. You're making no sense. Guys, you guys need to, those of you that don't know this, you need to study. Seriously, you need to understand what's going on. What is your take on the Gregorian calendar versus the Julian calendar? Uh, I don't trust either one of them. Um, again, we can trace the set. There's always been seven days, so we know when the Sabbath day starts. The feast days, there are scriptures that tell us why we don't have a proper calendar right now, and it's because we left keeping the commandments. So it's very simple. Um, will those days, those dates be given back to us? Yes. No, that's not the argument, Free Willy. We're not saying it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. Don't try to twist and gaslight me. I'm telling you the Sabbath day is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. What does that have to do with doing good on the Sabbath? What is your take on taking medicine? Uh, if you have to take medicine, that's something that you have to do, take it. If you don't, don't take it. Yeah, most of them are just bots that come in here, and some of them are just people that like to argue. Um, again, I'm only interacting with her so that other people that are on here can hear the truth. I could care less what she thinks. Again, it's clear. It's crystal clear. When you have knowledge and understanding in the prophets and the law, when people come along and you ask them, do you keep the commandments? Nope. Do you keep the Sabbath day holy? Nope. The Messiah is my Sabbath. Right there. I've tested your spirit and I know who you are. Again, you're gaslighting free willy. You're twisting what we're talking about, which is keeping the Sabbath day holy. And now you're trying to gaslight me with saying, is it wrong to do good on the Sabbath when the Messiah said clearly it is not? He actually said, if one of your animals falls in a ditch, will you not rush out immediately and get that animal out of the ditch? Because the animal was their livelihood and he was healing on the Sabbath. So what does that have to do with keeping the Sabbath day? Uh, Mama Wendy, that's a question that, again, it's I've covered this before, but again, I don't want to be a stumbling block to people. The feasts are all in the beginning of the first five books. If you read the first five books, especially um, after you get through Genesis and all of that, you'll start seeing the law. You'll read the law and you'll realize the church has been telling us there's 613 laws. You can't keep them all, right? So there's not 613 laws. There might be 25 or 35 that apply to you, but they all have to do with the Ten Commandments. All of the law and the prophets hang off of those ten. So it's all about loving either the Father or loving your neighbor. So when it boils down at the end of the day, when people actually go through and study what applies to them, the Messiah didn't keep 613 laws. He couldn't keep the laws for Levitical priests. He wasn't a Levitical priest. He couldn't keep the laws for farmers, which is a big chunk along with the Levitical priest laws because he wasn't a farmer. He couldn't keep the laws for women. He wasn't a woman. He could only fulfill the laws that pertain to him as a man on the earth. <clears throat> I think what Free Willy is trying to say here is that it's wrong to do good on the Sabbath. Because if that's what you're saying, I, you, make, you make no sense. Healing on the Sabbath was what's something the Messiah was doing. It's not something that you're going to be doing. Again, you're not going to be doing anything unless you have the spirit of Yahweh in you. And clearly you do not. It's a shame that people are here trying to help you. And you just want to argue. So if you want to argue, go, ar go start a live on your page and go see if you can get people to listen to you. People can hear truth. If people truly are searching for truth, they can hear it. They don't need to be uh, coerced into believing it. I missed that. No problem, guys. It's my pleasure to be on here. It's my pleasure to help share the, the same truth that's been imparted to me. So, Free Willy, if you want to know how to keep the Sabbath, go study it out for yourself. I'm not going to spoon feed you. And again, stop gaslighting me. You don't want to argue with me about the Sabbath or anything in this book. I can guarantee you that. Um, what Bible would I recommend? I would say the scriptures. It's called the scriptures. It's probably one of the best translations that I've seen in a long time. 
But even with that, I still will use a strong skin coordinates. I still use other means to make sure I'm looking up words and stuff like that. Names especially. Always look up what the meaning of a name is in Hebrew. Uh, if you're in the Old Testament and you're reading a prophecy, look up the names and then you'll see the meaning of those names and you'll understand what the prophets what the prophecy is saying about whatever whatever text you're reading. Yes, thank you, Candace. A lot of this stuff that I'm covering, I'm just talking right now, but a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about right now uh, is on my YouTube page. Uh, yeah, you can, I have uh, I read from the Geneva Bible as well. Um, just understand, the Geneva Bible says that there's 13 years in a month. There's not. There's 12. Um, so just be mindful that certain things have been altered because of the scribes. The scribes have made this book in vain. They have altered certain things and lied. And it's in our modern day translations. Uh, he's the master of the Sabbath. Lord and God are titles. Uh, so Satan is called Lord, which means Baal or Baal. Uh, and you're calling the Messiah Jesus Christ. His name is Yeshua. So if you look up the Strong's Concordance for Jesus and Christ and look at what the original meanings of those names are, or titles for Christ, um, Messiah just means anointed. Jesus, the letter J is only 500 years old, so why are you calling him Jesus? The Messiah said, I have come in my Father's name and you receive me not, but if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. The Jesus Christ that's being preached in these churches that you've been called out of, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her plagues, that Jesus is teaching people the law's been done away with. We don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. And Daniel prophesied that one, Satan would come, Daniel 7:25 seeking to change the times and the laws. Well, he's changed the times from Saturday to Sunday, and the law has been done away with. And these same churches that you hypocrites come in here and talk about are passing around a collection plate saying the law's been done away with, yet is tithing part of the law? Come out of her, my people, lest you want to partake in her plagues. Yeah, that's not... Renee, I, I see what you're saying, but that's not how a transliteration works, right? Uh, if you look up the word salvation in Hebrew, it says Yeshua. Yeshua is our salvation. Although salvation comes from the Father, the name Yeshua, when the Messiah says, I have come in my Father's name, they translated Joshua properly, right? When you read Joshua in Hebrew, they've translated that properly. So why did they translate the name of Yeshua, which is close to Joshua, to Jesus Christ. Understand, Revelation talks about this. Let those who have understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, chi z stigma. That's what John wrote in the original Greek. Chi z stigma. Jesus Christos. Jesus Christ. Can you please share the difference between Strong's Concordance versus... I can't see all of it for some reason. I won't let me see exhaustive concordance. Uh, they just go into deeper. Some of them have uh, like a root. Some of them only have their definition of the word and then uh, others will have the root original meanings of the words. It just depends on, I would always go back to the root meaning of a word every time. But every day and each Sabbath, I could fine tune myself according to the law. I really opened my eyes. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's being obedient and loving the Father is something that people are not understanding. If we simply love our Father, we're obedient to the things that he warns us not to do. We do the things that he loves, and we don't do the things that he hates. This is why in the New Testament, in the book of John, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. The man that says he knows me and does not keep my commandments is a liar, and there is no truth in him. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to these words, it is because there is no truth in them. To the law of Yahweh and the testimony of his son. Revelation 12, let's go read Revelation 12 and see when the dragon sends a flood out of his mouth, which is a flood of nations, which is why we have our borders wide open. When he sends this flood out of his mouth, who is he going after? Verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the woman that's in travail giving birth to the remnant, uh, which is Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. It says, 
that this dragon is wroth with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. Okay, so having the testimony of our Messiah means we're walking as he walked. We're walking in his footsteps. He kept the law. He kept the dietary laws. He kept the feast days. He did everything perfectly and took on a curse for us and became a curse for us so that we could be reunited back with our father. Because in the book of Jeremiah, we were all given a bill of divorcement. We're all separated from him. The only way to him is through our mediator and high priest, the man, Yeshua the Messiah. The father cannot become a man, folks. He's an invisible spirit, remember? The Messiah is the visible image of the invisible Elohim. Why? Because the Messiah took on the very nature of his father. But the Messiah wasn't just born in Mary, and that was the beginning of his existence. The Messiah existed long before he was born in Mary's womb. He took on flesh in Hebrews chapter, two, in Hebrews chapter 2. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But in Hebrews chapter 1, he's elevated above the angels. Why? He's the first brought forth out of all of them. And if, if, again, people don't believe me what I'm saying here. Let's see the Messiah's own words. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Question, who are the morning stars? It makes it very clear all throughout this book. In Job 38, 7, it's, let's go read that, Job 38, 7. It talks about these morning stars, just like in Genesis, right? So Job 38, verse 7. So Job is being questioned, right? Job is asking, where were you when I did all of these things, Job? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, and who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, shouted for joy? So upon the completion of the earth, there were angels there that were shouting for joy. So the angels were created before the earth was created. So who is the Messiah? He's the first brought forth, the firstborn of all creation. Again, in the same book of Revelation, let's not take my word for it. Let's see what the Messiah says out of his own mouth. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Yahweh. What did the Messiah just say? He's the beginning of the creation of his father Yahweh. Guys, don't get this twisted. Verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. Question, will we be morning stars? According to scripture, we will be just like the angels. So the angels that fell, a remnant of Jacob will be saved to replace them. Again, guys, don't have to question who the stars are. Revelation chapter 9, a star falls from heaven and opens the bottomless pit. Who is that? Satan. All angels are called morning stars. Not just one, all. And I've seen people say, well, Jesus or the Messiah is the devil because it calls him a morning star and it calls Satan, oh, Lucifer, how have thou fallen from heaven? Right? They take that and they try to say, well, that's the Messiah. No. All angels are called morning stars. Revelation chapter 1. What does John see? What is the mystery that's in the hand of the Messiah because he now commands these angels? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. He's holding seven stars in his hand, right? So how do we know that the Messiah now commands these seven stars? Well, let's go to the book of... Uh, Ze uh, Ze Zechariah chapter 4, and let's read about how the Messiah would prevail and then have commandment over all the armies in, of heaven, right? We see this in the book of Joshua. It says, uh, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was a man in Scripture 
who went and freed the captives. Zerubbabel means sown into Babylon. The Messiah was also sown into Babylon, and he also came to free us from captivity, right? So this is what Zerubbabel, the man, did. But this isn't talking about the man Zerubbabel. This is talking about the Messiah. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith Yahweh of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, Satan? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings and crying, Grace, grace, unto it. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that Yahweh of hosts hath sent me unto you, the Messiah, people. For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice when they see the plummet, the stone, in the hand of Zerubbabel, which are those seven. They are the eyes of Yahweh, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So what is the Messiah holding in Revelation chapter 1? these seven archangels that are the eyes of Yahweh that go to and fro throughout the earth. The Messiah commands them. That's why he's returning with them in Revelation 19. That's why in Joshua chapter 5, a man appears to Joshua with a sword in his hand. And Joshua says, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he says, nay, but as the captain of the host of the armies of Yahweh, I am now come. So this man that's standing there with a sword is proclaiming who he is. Revelation chapter 19. He is the captain of the host of Yahweh. He leads the armies of Yahweh because he is the first brought forth. If Yahweh was able to be everywhere at one time like everybody says, or that people can see Yahweh when the Messiah says, No man has seen the Father at any time, nor seen his shape, nor heard his voice. All prophecy has been given to us by means of of angels all amos 3 7 surely yahweh will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants the prophets so hebrews chapter 1 in times past the father spoke to us by the prophets to our fathers but in these last days has spoken through his son was his son a prophet very clearly he was did his son have the same exact will as he no the son prayed to the father. He didn't just go out and, and pray to himself, people, that makes no sense. He went out and he prayed to his father, okay? When he was about to be crucified, he prays to the father and he says, Father, if it is possible, allow this cup to pass from me. Can you please repeat the piece you said, Yah has the seven archangels? Not Yah. Yahweh has given the commandment of all the armies of heaven to the Messiah in Revelation chapter 1. When John turns to see the voice that is speaking with him, which is Yahweh's voice, right? But it's done through an angel, through agency. When he turns to see the voice that is speaking with him, he sees the Messiah standing there, right? When he looks and he at, he's seeing this vision of the seven stars, the Messiah tells him at the end of the chapter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand are the seven angels of the seven churches. These are the seven archangels that we just read about in uh, Zechariah chapter 4. These are the seven who's are, who are the eyes of Yahweh who go to and fro in the earth. Right? There are seven archangels and under them myriads of angels. And they're in a military structure. Each angel commands myriads of angels under them. But everything is done through agency. When the burning Moses is at the burning bush, Moses hears Yahweh's commandments, but it's being spoken by an angel. He turns to see the voice that's speaking with him, and who's standing there? An angel in a burning bush. Same thing happens with John in Revelation chapter 1. He hears. He looks to see. Who does he see? The Messiah. The angel of Yahweh's presence. The angel that was sent before Moses in Exodus 23. I'm sending an angel before thee to keep thee in the way. Do not provoke him. Obey his voice. For my name is in him. 
Did they listen? No, Isaiah 63, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. The law that was given was given to them by an angel. That pillar of fire that they were afraid of in Deuteronomy is the Messiah. He had a name before he came to earth as Yeshua. But again, some of these things are just going to be too far. You just have to go to my YouTube page and watch some of the videos that are on there because I'm only giving you, I'm only speaking right now. I'm just speaking and I'm reading certain passages, but you can't understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the prophets. Everything that's happening in the book of Revelation has been explained in the Old Testament. Everything. The beasts that are rising up out of the sea, that's the book of Daniel. The hailstones and fire mingled with blood, that's the 144,000 that the angel in Revelation 8 is casting into the earth, followed by a mountain, a great mountain burning, right? What is that great mountain? Daniel chapter 2 explains it. it's a mountain not cut by human hands that smotes Nebuchadnezzar's statue, the ten-toed kingdom, the beast system, the beast kingdom, smashes it into pieces. Peter was renamed Simon Barjonas. Simon Barjonas means a small piece of the rock. The Messiah said he was going to build his church upon Peter. That small rock became a great big burning mountain by the time you get to Revelation chapter 8. But it's interesting that there are seven angels standing in Revelation 8, and then another angel comes out, an eighth angel comes out, and he offers the prayers of the saints unto the Father, and then he takes the censer that's in his hand and dips it with the fire of the altar. How will the earth be destroyed? By fire. And he casts it into the earth. First, 144, then the remnant. They're caught up at the seventh trump and changed in the twinkling of an eye. It's by fire. It's by Yahweh's children that the wicked shall be destroyed. When the Messiah says, bring these evil people before me and slay them with the sword. Who do you think's doing the slaying there? It's the 144,000. People don't understand this woman that's in travail all throughout the Old Testament. She's going to give birth to the remnant of Jacob. That will be the last generation that will live to, on this earth when tribulation starts. Out of that remnant, a remnant shall be saved. Out of that remnant is taken 144,000 holy priests. They're taken up mid-tribulation when the two prophets' bodies are taken, the two witnesses. When they go, the 144,000 go with them. Then, when, they, when the new earth is founded, the 144, New Jerusalem, comes back down to minister to the remnant and teach them how to keep the laws, commandments, statutes, feasts, they're going to be learning for that three and a half, the last three and a half years of tribulation, when the remnant is hidden away, they're going to be learning directly from the Father. They're going directly to the Father's throne. And then they're going to come back down here and minister to the remnant, and then they're going to present the remnant back to the Father for remarriage, which is Revelation 21, 1 through 7. <clears throat> and it was the Messiah that gave commandment to Joshua himself to slay those people. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. So that's a foreshadowing of the 144,000 who will be wielding swords, and they're going to come back and slay all of the wicked who are on the earth. Uh, those that are following the commandments and doing what they're supposed to be doing, they've turned back into covenant with the Father, they've been baptized, washed of, of their sin, and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they're the remnant on the new earth. However, the, the Father has called the 144 to wake the remnant up. Once that f last person of the 144,000 wakes up, all hell is going to break loose here on the earth. Daniel 12, verse 1. When Michael the restrainer is removed, there's going to be a time on this earth that never was before. Michael is over the better part of mankind and over chaos. So when Michael goes, tribulation begins. Matthew 24, all of these things the Messiah lists off that are going to happen, and he says all of these are the beginning of birth pains. Revelation chapter 12, the woman that's in travail, she gives birth. And as soon as she gives birth, the 144, they're called up to the throne of Yahweh. Right? The remnant, the two prophets come, eat the, two, the eagle with the two wings, the law and the prophet. Enoch, Elijah. 
When those two prophets come, they make a highway or a safe passage for the remnant to get into the promised land and they're hidden away. In Revelation 6, you see souls under the altar crying out. Those people, those men that die, that are crying out saying, How long, O Yahweh? Doest thou make us wait and not avenge those that have taken our lives and our brothers who are still on the earth? They're going to lay their life. They're going to be the people surrounding this hidden land, this promised land, which is not where people think it is. And they're going to lay their lives down protecting the remnant. That's how the remnant survives until the seventh trump. Uh, we're at the timeline of the birth pains ending and tribulation beginning. We are very close to the end. Um, it's, it's not going to be very long until we start seeing uh, everything that was spoken about happening here on the earth. We're already starting to see it. The weather is changing. Technology has increased. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, people shall go to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. That's happening. Um, we're, we're at the door, guys. It's, there's not a lot of time left. There's a great falling away that's already taken place, which is the Christian church. <clears throat> Christians will argue till they're blue in, the, blue in the face and they have no clue what they're talking about. Yes, I posted the I posted three videos uh, on YouTube this morning. Yep, they will. They're going to be taking heads off very soon. Uh, Daydreamer, we're already invaded. That's Joel chapter one and two. The locust army is already here. They just haven't attacked yet. They're attacking in in uh, in a way where it's very small right now. Um, but they're already here. They've already invaded other countries. Other countries have all already fallen. So this locust army, when Satan opens the bottomless pit, evil spirits are going to come up out of that pit and they're going to go into all these other nations. And these other nations are going to come after Israel directly. And if you know who Israel is, you'll understand why. This is why Vladimir Putin came out and said, oh, we found this archive, and this, these are the true Israelites, Jews claiming to be Jews who are not but do lie. Those people over there in the land of, of uh, so-called Israel that was bought 150 years ago by the Rothschilds, the Belford Declaration, and they named it Israel. Where does Scripture, where does Zephaniah 3 say Scripture, or say the promised land is located? Says, let's, let's go read Zephaniah. Let's see. Let's see if Scripture is lying or if we've been lied to. Because again, Zephaniah doesn't mention anything about the promised land being called Israel. Jacob wrestled with an angel and that angel renamed him Israel. And out of his loins came 12 children. And those 12 children are scattered across the whole earth. So if there are people in one land that are claiming to be Judah, they're lying. That's why we're warned about it in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Ah, where is it? Let's see. Right here, Zephaniah 3, I'll read 9 through 10. It says, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of Yahweh to serve him with one consent, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my, suppl my supplicants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. From beyond where? The rivers of Ethiopia, south of the rivers of Cush. Where is that located? Africa, people. The maps that they gave us and the maps that they've shown you are a lie. Remember when, when Moses and the people were trying to travel through Moab, they couldn't go through Moab. They denied them safe passage, which is why it says that a Moabite shall never enter the kingdom of Yahweh, the congregation of Yahweh, ever. So the actual path that they took, it's not through this land. When they crossed the Red Sea, what land did they enter? Palestine, people. Just because someone bought and paid for land in that Palestinian land and named it Israel in 1948, the Rothschilds, but out of, out of all people, Christians are going to trust in the Rothschilds who bought that land? I've shown you guys the proof of it. 
And in fact, I posted the videos on my YouTube channel. They're already up this morning. It's called The Promised Land. Go watch them. Do your own research. Because that star that they fly over there, the star of Remphan, their god, why would I follow them? Now, am I saying that some of the 12 tribes are not there? No. They're scattered in every nation. But the ones that actually are saying that they are something that they're not, they hate you even though their skin color is exactly the same as yours. They hate you with a passion because you believe in the return of the Messiah. And they aren't who they say they are either. They took that land. They're Khazarian people. They took that land by force. Just like the people that are in the land of Egypt are not the same people that were in the land of Egypt in the scripture. It was the Canaanites who were in the land of Egypt in biblical times. Now it's a totally different people. Maps have been changed. Calendars have been changed. The feast days have been changed. Everything has been made a lie. This is why the prophets say, our fathers have inherited lies. So have we. We're waking up to truth. This is, again, what Ezekiel 37 is about. The valley of dry bones. Yahweh tells Ezekiel, prophesy. And then uh, tissue and sinew and muscle wrap around the bodies, but they lay there lifeless. He says, prophesy again. And then he breathes the breath of life into them. And then what does he promise them? He promises to return them back to their own land. We're waking up right now, people. Some of us have been awake for a, while, a long time now. Some people are just now starting to wake up. That's fine. Either way, we just read what happens for those that have this knowledge and don't share it. I don't want anybody's blood on my hand. And again, I won't become a liar for any person. Yahweh has a peculiar chosen people. So what happens when Putin stands up and says, these are the true Jews? Deception. He wants that land. He wants, the, he wants Africa. And this isn't the first time he's went after their their uh, country. Why is it that all of the South Africans that are in Africa right now that look exactly like I look, why is it that the people that are in the rest of Africa are trying to push them out of that land? Because the rest of their land is cursed. The only people that can do any good over there in Africa and farm and make money and actually grow crops. Remember, the curse of Cain was that he would become a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Has that changed? No. But yet we have people that are out there with microphones dressed up like purple Power Rangers telling other people to apologize for the color of their skin and get down and kiss their boots and that they're going to be servants to them in the kingdom when they're the children of Cain. And Cain is the child of Satan, not Adam. Show me in Genesis chapter 5 where Cain is Adam's son. He won't. And if people understood what was going on in Genesis chapter 3, they would know that the father punished Adam and Eve, but he punishes Eve first. And for eating off of an apple on a tree from a talking snake? I think not. Ezekiel and Isaiah make it clear that that tree was a covering cherub of the Garden of Eden until iniquity was found in him. He taught Eve about children and how to make children, which is why she gave birth to two different children, twins. It's called super fecundation. It's when two men go into one woman and she gives birth to twins, and one child belongs to the one man and the other child belongs to the other man. It still happens to this day. So you mean to tell me they ate off a tree and Yahweh punished Eve and said, now that you've done this, I'm going to cause you to give uh, birth to children in pain. He impregnated her because she ate off a tree. <laughs> you can say that's a lie all you want, buddy. What is what is what are the what do the apostles tell us that Cain was of that wicked one, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning? Does it not? Why is Cain's lineage in Genesis chapter four? And no mention of Cain in Genesis chapter 5. And why is Eve called the mother of all living in Genesis chapter 3? Because she is. She was. Eve was the mother to Cain. She gave birth to Cain. Adam raised Cain. But then after Cain unalived Abel, being a unaliver from the beginning, just as scripture says, what happened? 
Yahweh marked Cain, lest anyone finding Cain would unalive him. So if Cain and Abel are the first two born on the earth, who would Cain be afraid of finding him and unaliving him? Have you guys ever even stopped, the ones of you that are arguing, have you ever stopped to even consider this? Or do you just read through the scripture and believe whatever some mindless pastor tells you? Because I've been there, done that. I'm not going back to that nonsense. If you want to learn, you better study this book. And don't tell me, well, Genesis chapter 4, 1 says, well, Eve says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. What did Eve know? All Eve knew in Genesis chapter 2, in the last verse, it says, The man and the woman were both naked and not ashamed. Then they partook of a tree, which we know what trees are all throughout Scripture. They're not talking about physical trees. They partook of knowledge. Just like when you drink good or bad wine in Scripture, it's talking about doctrine, not wine. So don't argue unless you know what you're talking about. The Bible talks about this all from Genesis chapter 3 throughout the entire book. This is why Israel was not allowed to mix seed with other nations. This is how Esau became the father of the Edomites. He was mixing seed. He had the first right as the firstborn, but he sold his birthright. And then in Genesis chapter 26, he marries two Hivite women, fallen bloodline women, which became a grievance of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. And then Rebecca goes on to say, if Jacob does this, what good would my life be? So what is, what is the, uh, what did, what does uh, Jacob's parents command him to do? To go and marry back into her brother's family side, which is Laban, L-A-B-A-N, Strong's Concordance number 3837 and 3836. What does Laban mean? White ones. What does ruddy mean? To blush and show blood under the skin. What did we read about David earlier? That David was ruddy and that he was fair in continence. What does fair mean? In Jeremiah chapter 6, when Yahweh is uh, punishing the people and he says, were they ashamed for the abominations that they had committed? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor could they blush. Why? They were mixing seed. They were raising up children to other nations. Is it not written in the Torah, you shall not mix seed with other nations outside of Israel? Again, not going to argue about this. I'm not even going to I'm not even going to keep bringing it up. I'm just trying to let people know that there's more to this book than what people realize. Yeah, I, if you love bacon, I got I've got a per, the perfect thing for you, bro. Hold on a second. Let me read this for you really quickly. I'm going to read Isaiah 65 and 66 for you just so you know what's coming for you. <clears throat> All right, in Isaiah 66, I'm in the wrong chapter, hold on. In Isaiah 66, it makes it very clear what's going to happen to those. In verse 17, it says, They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst doing the works of Satan, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith Yahweh. So enjoy your bacon and your parasites. Christian, Christian people that are in here boasting about doing what the Father says in a, is, is clearly an abomination, right? So instead of you giving up bacon... You would rather come in here and start running your mouth talking about, well, I'm going to love my bacon. Well, love it and enjoy it while you can because soon you're going to be like uh, the rich man in Abraham's bosom where you're begging for someone to quench the burning of your tongue. Enjoy it. Hope it's worth it. And for all you Christians that say the Messiah made all foods clean, you know that that's in brackets, which means somebody added that to the scripture. It's not in the original text. And that context of that conversation wasn't about food. It was about the washing of hands, and it was about what comes out of the heart, the mouth speaks, and taming the tongue. Had nothing to do with what they ate and what went into the draft and went out, or what went out of the draft, the toilet. Uh, it had nothing to do with that. The Messiah did not declare all foods clean. 
Peter's vision was not about food. It was about no longer calling the tribes that were divorced unclean because the Messiah made them clean with his blood. Was Christ not enough? Well, let me ask you this. What is the gospel? Is the gospel only the death, burial, and resurrection? As Christians love to preach? <laughs> Twisting Paul's letters. 2 Peter 3, 15-17. Go read it. Those that are unsteady in the law will take Paul's letters and wrestle with them, literally, and twist them to their own destruction. Paul taught seven different laws. So how do you know when you're reading Paul's letters what law he's talking about when you have no knowledge of the law? The gospel was the law fulfilled. Again, we've already covered this. When you guys say, the Messiah made it very clear, very clear when he said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For verily, verily, I say unto you, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled? Are we on the new earth? No. Then he goes on to say, therefore, the man that relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom. The man that does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So stop cherry picking scripture. Days before the Messiah was crucified, he said, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. What did they do when they sat on Moses' seat? They read the Torah. And the Messiah said, anytime they're sitting on this seat, that you do and observe. But when they're not reading from the Torah, do not do as they do, for they are hypocrites. Do you know that the Jews of the Messiah's time are the ones that crucified him? If you people would stop arguing and go study, you might learn something. Yeah, faith, faith without works is death, right? We know that. Hebrews chapter 3 makes this very clear. They had an evil heart of unbelief. They transgressed the law, and they didn't have faith. They didn't trust the Father. Hebrews, uh, even James chapter 2, people say, well, uh, Abraham was justified by faith alone. No, he wasn't. Genesis would differ with what your opinion says. It says, because Abraham kept my laws, statutes, and commandments, I will promise this land that I promised to him unto you and your descendants. Very clear, people. You guys think that the law has been done away with because you don't understand the second law that was added for disobeying the first law, which was the sacrificial law, where you had to take an innocent animal and slay it because of your sin. Now the Messiah has shed his blood, doing away with that law that Paul is talking about. The divorce letter in Deuteronomy 28, the curses of the law. Read Deuteronomy 28 all the way through. And then read Deuteronomy 30, the last two verses. I call heaven and earth to, re to record this against you this day. I hold before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life. Choose the blessings that are listed in verse 1 through 16. But from verse 16 to 67, they're all curses. And let me show you something else, genius. Let's go here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Yahweh and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The last book, or the last chapter of Revelation in, in the last book of the Bible says there shall be no more curse. Hmm. I wonder if Paul was preaching about this curse and being under the law, which means you're still under the divorce. You're still separated from Yahweh because you haven't returned back to his covenant. You Christians love to say, I'm part of the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I don't have to keep the law or the priesthood attached to it. You make no sense. You're making yourself sound ignorant. Uh, how do I define the gospel? Well, the gospel is much more than the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the wedding covenant, right? 
Yahweh gave us a law, laws and commandments to keep. We broke those laws and commandments. Then he added the sacrificial law as a punishment. Then he sent all the prophets to get us to turn back to keeping his laws. And all of the prophets that were sent were unalived, right? And not only that, the people said, no, we will not do what Yahweh says. We will keep doing what we want to do, just like the Christian church is doing today. Then the father sends his son and they do the same thing to him. They wind up crucifying him. Although he lays his life down, they still said, crucify him. Pontius Pilate's like, for what? What did he do? Even Pilate was like, why do you guys want to crucify him? They knew who he was, people. The Messiah didn't say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's in your modern day translations. Go look it up in the original text. In fact, go read Psalm 69. You'll hear the Messiah praying, saying, to blot them out of the book of the living. Those were the Canaanites and the bulls of Bashan. Who was the oak of Bashan? Who was his father? He's mentioned in the book of Enoch. Why did the father command people to go slay man, woman, and child? Were they his children? No. The Messiah said, Every tree that my heavenly father did not plant will be plucked up and cast into the lake of fire. So you guys want to deny what happened in Genesis chapter 3, deny what happened in Genesis chapter 6. Where do you think those watchers in Genesis chapter 6 got the idea to do what they did by going into the daughters of men and bearing giants, the Nephil, you know, the ones that were 3,000 L's high? History and scripture will disprove everything that you people run your mouths about. Everything about this has to do with seed and blood. All of it. My Christian neighbor tells me my roommate is not in the book of life, but she eats bacon. Yeah, bacon is an abomination. Swine is an abomination. Flesh and blood and not enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Saul disobeyed and where does it say Saul be what? I don't know if I'm about. So how does she stand on her words? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. If you're eating the flesh of swine and you know what the Torah says about what is a clean, what is considered food for Israel and what is not, if you're eating bacon, as we just read in uh, Isaiah 66, and it's in Isaiah 65, you're going to be destroyed. It's an abomination. Your body is the temple. So what you put into your body is, especially when it comes to foods that are called abominations, then you're not, you can't expect a holy Elohim to dwell in your temple when you're defiling it with abominations, right? And there's a reason why the Father says not to eat swine's flesh. Okay, so, no, Sophia is not wisdom. People, you got to stop coming up with this nonsense. The Messiah is wisdom. If you read Solomon's writings, you would know this. Stop bringing up this Sophia character. Sophia is not in scripture. It's not biblical. And saying that the, Messi the Messiah is not wisdom, you're denying everything the prophets say about who the Messiah is, everything that Yahweh says about who the Messiah is, and everything who the wisest man aside from... Um, the Messiah, which was King Solomon said, who the Messiah was, which is wisdom. There is no female spirit, folks. It's it's prophetical speech. I, I understand that, but I've seen people preaching that Sophia is this feminine spirit, which is wisdom. It's not true. The spirit of wisdom was given by the Father to the Messiah. He is wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 8, you can hear the Messiah talking that he was with the Father from before the earth was, right? And he goes through and he says, he was brought forth. He was brought forth. Well, what does it mean to be begotten? To be brought forth. And at the very end of that, he says, um, my delights were with the sons of men, right? Bro, read. No, I'm not. Why would I read? This is the problem with you people. 
you guys want to go outside of what is biblical and you want to go by the deities that have put these books together that are not biblical. They don't align with any of the prophets. You go read the Gnostic Gospels. I've, I've already seen enough of it. I read Enoch because it was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Enoch knew everything that the prophets speak about. It aligns with the, the prophecies in this book perfectly. So again, don't argue with me. I've studied all these books. I know what ones are scripture and what ones are not. If you cannot go by what the prophets speak, and it doesn't align with what the prophets speak, you better throw it out. Because in this book, it makes it very clear who wisdom is and who wisdom is not. Wisdom comes directly from the Father. Wisdom was hidden away and given to the Messiah. So when you read Proverbs 8, read what it's saying and slow down and understand that the Messiah's delights were with the sons of men, hence the reason why he came down. His delights were with his Father's creation. That's why scripture says there's no greater love than to lay your life down for your neighbor or for your brother. What did the Messiah do? He laid his life down. And what did the Jews say? Well, in the Old Testament, it says you can't sacrifice with human blood. He laid his life down, folks. They crucified him. Satan's the one that crucified him. But he gave his life for his brethren. We don't call God our brother, do we? Yes, all, all believers in our Messiah will also, uh, Scripture says that we will share in his glory, but we will also share in his suffering. But the suffering that we share in is life. It's being in a fallen world. Remember John 17, the Messiah's prayer. We're not... He's not from this world, and neither are we. Yeah, I agree about the Old Testament thing. It, I refer to the Old Testament and New Testament because uh, people are always referring to it as that. It's just one continual book. Yeah, it's already uploaded. It's already up on YouTube. Yeah, unalivers, all of that's mentioned in um, Revelation 21 and 22, who will enter and who will not. But all sin, when someone comes to the knowledge of truth and they go get baptized, once you're baptized, all sin is forgiven. So when people come to truth, don't rush out and get baptized until you understand why you're being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you finally do get to that understanding, then you go get baptized. Then you become a new creation. Then you can return back to the Father. But make sure you're walking correctly before, or make sure you know how to walk correctly before you do that. If the world loves, you are aware. If the world hates you, it's because you're not from this world. Yes. No, I'm not saying Solomon was a Messiah. Remember when Solomon said, when Solomon, when Yahweh asked Solomon to ask of anything, and Solomon said his prayer was that he would be given wisdom, that he might lead the Father's people. And because his prayer was righteous, the Father said, not only am I going to give you wisdom and understanding, but I'm also going to give you riches. Right? He gave him a great wealth. Then, later on, when the Messiah comes, he's talking about the queen coming to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And the Messiah says, Behold, one greater than Solomon is here. Well, when Solomon made that prayer, Yahweh told Solomon, There will be no man that was before you that will have more wisdom than you, and no man that will come after you that will have more wisdom than you. Yet the Messiah says, Behold, one greater than Solomon is here. How can you be greater than Solomon unless you are wisdom? Again, let me, just, let me just share a couple of things with you guys pertaining to this wisdom thing. <clears throat> wisdom is something that was hidden away in Yeshua from the very beginning of the world. And he's now hidden away in the bosom of the Father. He's also the spirit of prophecy. Without the Messiah, we can't have relationship with the Father because he is 
standing between us and the Father until we are reunited or remarried. Listen to Proverbs 8, 22 through 31 really quickly. It says, Yahweh possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I was brought forth. This means begotten. While yet he has not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, and when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. That's your Messiah speaking. Now, concerning the Messiah, Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of Yahweh, and shall make him quick in understanding in the fear. And he shall not judge after the sight of his own eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his own ears. When the Messiah walked the earth, did he not say, I don't speak unless my Father commands me to speak? Now, Matthew 12, 41 through 42, it says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they, repent, they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came to, from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Uh, also, <clears throat> there's many, many scriptures pertaining to wisdom um, that I would suggest people do a study on wisdom alone. Because someone's footnotes a priest or a pastor or whoever was in, involved in adding these things into scripture just because it's talking about a feminine spirit right if you don't understand prophetical speech you won't know what thorns is you won't know what thistles are you're not going to know what trees are you're not going to know what mountains represent you're not going to know what the torah is whether it's good wine or bad wine like all of this is is prophetically coded the prophet spoke in parables the same way the Messiah did. Yahweh said that he would utter dark sayings and speeches, prophecy, that only his children would understand. So if you're just coming into this and you don't fully understand it, that's fine. But if you keep pursuing truth, your eyes will be open to the truth and you will be able to understand it. But if people are thinking that they can just serve the Messiah when they're feeling like they want to and just spend time with the Messiah and call him God and not keep any of the, the things that his father told us to do, then we're going to have a huge problem, right? You're going to have a hard time learning about anything because you're actively denying what the father told us to do from the very beginning and their prophecies, they cannot change. No prophecy in this book can be changed. When, the, when Yahweh the father speaks these things, it's set in stone. It doesn't change. All we can do is wait for the fulfillment of those things to happen, which we've seen many of them happen already. And we know Scripture makes it very clear. In Acts chapter 7, it makes it very clear that we have received the law by dispensation of angels. Acts 7.53. Okay? And then also in Acts 7... Uh, 35 and 36, it tells you that it's an angel that gave Moses the law, right? It says, this Moses whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did Yahweh send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of an angel which appeared to him in the bush. He, the angel, brought them out 
and showed them wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. What, what, what angel is this talking about? What are they quoting from? Well, let's go read it in Exodus 23. Again, guys, this has nothing to do with what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and what Christians believe and all of this. It has everything to do with what does the scripture say. This is why I don't, I don't take to any denominations because all these denominations are just twisting the word of Yahweh to no end. <clears throat> uh, let's see, was it? I'm in, I'm in Acts. Sorry, I need to go to Exodus 23. Exodus 23, 20. Listen very closely. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, the angel. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, the angel's voice, and do all that I speak... So who speaks? Who's the voice? The angel. Then I will be an enemy unto your enemies and an adversary unto your adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So what did he say in verse 21? Beware of this angel. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. He will not pardon your transgressions. Wait a minute. Can an angel pardon transgression, uh, transgressions? Well, one did. He came in the flesh, and he became a curse and took on the sin of the whole earth. He walked the earth for 33 years without sin. Yes, this is speaking of Yeshua. This is Yeshua, your Messiah. And then in Isaiah 63, what is he saying right here in Exodus 23? He's saying, if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, I will be an enemy unto your enemies and an adversary unto your adversaries. Did they obey his voice in Isaiah 63? No. And what happened? The angel of his presence, 